survivors see what it takes to keep the U.S. Constitution perfectly preserved. Plus, awesome maps for your summer road trips and protecting your freedom in this age of information warfare. Live from the Tech TV studios in San Francisco, it's the Screen Saver! The Screensavers. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Kevin Rose. Thanks for joining us on The Screensavers, the show that gives you your daily dose of technology. We're continuing today with TSS Goes to Washington Week. All of us took a visit to our nation's capital to show you some cool things like inside the FCC labs and an interview with FCC Chairman Michael Powell. Leo, walk in the yes. walk. Yes, they the actually man. went to Best Buy or something like that, right? You, well, you don't give it too Pick much down away. his gear. Well, he's going to talk about like how he, he goes there... Well, you know what? Why don't we leave the <laughs> okay. segment to right. explain it? Tonight's a great show. We're going to show you some amazing maps for your summer road trips. And Sarah, what's your DC segment today? Well, you know, the U.S. Constitution, let's just say. Do you have any idea how it's encased and preserved so that it will never degrade over time? It's amazing. It's yes. amazing. It, it, it takes a lot more than you would think. And I took a, I, I had someone actually kind of saw it in half and was not the actual Constitution, <laughs> but a replica of it. And let me know how they put it all together. It's pretty cool. Like com coming up in a little bit. <laughs> I did not. I did not saw. Were you worried the there for a second? Sarah shreds the Constitution. <laughs> no more Constitution. This priceless <laughs> document. <laughs> Sorry. Dan, what are you up to on the show today? I'm taking your phone calls as usual every day. Give me a call at 888-989-7879 and also email me at thescreensavers at techtv.com. Not bad. Oh, and if you have a uh, net cam, you get a free t-shirt. Not bad. Thank you, free t-shirt. Free t-shirt. Outstanding. Tech news? Tech news. Let's do it. Sarah's got the first story. I sure do. The U.S. Senate may vote on the Pirate Act as early as next week. If passed, the bill would put the Department of Justice in the position of the RIAA, letting federal officials file civil suits against copyright violators, of course, with potential fines of hundreds and thousands of dollars. Senator Orrin Hatch supports the bill and says only the U.S. government has the resources and moral authority to go after file swappers. Now, I, don't, I might agree with resources, but I don't know if moral authority is the first thing that comes to mind when I think of our government. <laughs> yeah. well, what do you guys think? I'm not even getting into the whole moral authority <sighs> thing, but it's like, of all the things the United States government has to do in its spare yeah. time, we've got the whole Iraq situation, mm -hmm. we've got the whole economic situation, we've got the whole trade imbalance, but what we're going to do is we're going to take the <laughs> DOJ and we're going to fire them up to get those file swappers. <laughs> um, now, I read through this story and... Uh, I'm not going to explain to understand all the legal jargon here. To, what right. does this mean to the end user, to, uh, to the average Joe out there? If it gets passed, if it becomes a law, if it goes into effect, what I, my understanding is what it means is the Department of Justice will be you know, going after you for, as a criminal offense for downloading files online. Rather the RIA doing you know, their suits, it will actually make it a criminal offense and the DOJ a federal crime. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like one of those moments where it's like hold up a 7-Eleven with a gun, you get two years and yeah. you're out in five. Swap you know, songs. Swap songs, you get a huge giant. You know. So now is this more than just fine. songs? Are we talking just stuff like music? Are I we talking will pirated be, software? I assume it will be any copyrighted material. Right. So. Any copyrighted okay. material being downloaded on peer-to-peer -peer sites. So this is a way to crack down on the peer-to-peer -peer sites when it comes yeah. to application swapping, movies, things of that nature Everything. as well. Everything. Everything. Now the RIA oh, is the big guns in this because you know you know we were joking earlier this week we're like hey they're picking up like three grand for every letter they send out to a file swapper maybe it's costing more than that yeah. or maybe they just want the government the federal government to do the RIAA's dirty work when are, they, it. when are they expecting this to pass how, how long do I'll we tell have you what, we got actually have a guest coming on Friday okay. from the EFF we'll ask come them all on. about it they're going to explain all about what's going on with the act, you know, where it is in, in government, and what exactly, you know, just a definitive legal understanding right. of what it means. So I just want to know day. how much time I have left, you know, <laughs> do a little swap in between now and then. I thought you were using other people's Wi-Fi hotspots to download. No, that would be bad. That would be bad. Don't yeah. talk about that stuff on air, Patrick. <laughs> Next story. Next story. Market research firm Vividence has found that 89% of people had a positive experience using Google search engine. Google's also ranked high in customer loyalty and future use categories. However, when researchers compared Google's actual search engine with those from Yahoo, Lycos, AskGeez, and 
and MSN, they found that they all returned very similar results. So Google still comes out the most customer friendly, but I'm wondering who paid for this study. That's what we're all wondering. Yeah. It's like it's an interesting study, right? This company basically they 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 see a classic marketing study. They pick a group of end users, they set up a study, they observe them, right. they they comment on their results. Normally this stuff gets paid for by somebody. And that's what we're always you know, did this company do this on their own out of curiosity? So we're thinking Microsoft, Yahoo, who we talking about? All of the above, yeah. the, you know, the anti because it's kind of funny. It's like, okay, it's time to kick Google right before the IPO. Yeah. Well, um, you know what's funny though? I kind of agree with them in in some sense. I absolutely Google's agree gotten with a little them. worse, and it seems that like Yahoo's gotten better. And uh, and Google bomb. I'll get me honest with you. Google bombing drives me nuts when you, you're st yeah. when you're starting to watch because because you know everybody's like it's, you know it's it's presidential candidates and stuff like that. But effectively, if you create a bunch of you know sites that advertise or sell through stuff, you effectively right. Google bomb the website and you make We're you know skewing your results. Exactly. It's just not right. It's not the way it should be. But. It's really frustrating. And apparently, as as in my understanding, it'd be interesting to get some information on this. As few as 32 pages have been linked to push something up to the top of the Google results. Yeah. So it's it's Google be bombing's a bad thing. Do you still use Google? You know, I still use Google. I still use Google. Sarah, still on Google? I'm a, I'm a Google. Freak. Although I have to admit, I've been using <laughs> I've been using Yahoo a lot more lately. Yeah, I like Yahoo for some things too. I like their directory yeah. and the human touch is sometimes nice. You know, when someone actually recommends it and puts it on there rather than just a machine yeah. determining how it's ranked. I don't know. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. You're welcome. Have a good show, gentlemen. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Corpus Christi, Texas. Is it Anson? That's right. How's it going today, Anson? Hey, Anson. I'm pretty good. How are you all doing today? Outstanding. Pretty good. All right. I have you. a question for you. Okay. Okay. There are two, uh, two questions, rather. Um, the first thing, how do you control the number of do downloads that are possible mm -hmm. from the default Microsoft Windows downloader? I seem to only be able to get two at a time. Right. Two or three at a time, and then you just click on something and nothing happens, right? That's right, yeah. Patrick's working in the back there, trying to fix it. The on. mouse, no, it's, it's dead. <laughs> we, we've killed another mouse. <laughs> another mouse died on us. We have a great demo set up for you, and I want you to get a picture in your mind. You know what? Why don't right? you just do a nice little Alt Tab and open up those windows? Can you do that? There you go. Download Accelerator Done. Plus. Bam. You have two options. Your fundamental option is to go and do a registry hack on Internet Explorer and allow it to open up right. more. Simultaneous yeah, I think downloads. Sarah's done this on the show in the past, where yeah. you can—it's a simple little tweak, and then it'll allow you to download four or five different mm -hmm. downloads at once, which will get past your problem. But, but Patrick has a better way. One of the things you can look at is, and you have to be very careful in what kind of download accelerator you choose, because there's a lot of them that included spyware, do tracking. We have to, most of us actually use Download Accelerator Plus. It's from Speedbit.com. Yeah, I've used that in the past. Okay. And what it'll do is, it not only will allow you to do multiple downloads at the same time, but it'll also allow you to download multiple or more than a single stream or a couple right. streams per download so you right. can you essentially make it look like you're seven different computers downloading information from a server and give you a much larger chunk of bandwidth. I do this a lot of the times when I'm downloading huge Linux I yeah. ISO files because sometimes you know there's 650, 700 megabytes in size rather than just click on one and have one mm -hmm. stream coming down at 50 some k a second right. it will connect to multiple servers and then pull all those streams and pull them together and putting in the right. byte order correctly and then you have a much faster download. Which is nice. Now Which we cool. have we have had some requests from people who run servers to basically say hey yeah. not more than four or five streams per download because the truth Sucks is, the is you're, yeah, yeah. you're going to you know, slurp all the bandwidth, you're going to make it miserable for everybody else using it. But Do you have time for the second question? What's that? Do you have time for the second question? Uh, yeah, why not? Why okay, not? all right. Real the, quick. The favorites list. I'm a, Mac, I'm a flight simulator 2004 junkie, and every time I save a, a, a website, for the first few days, I get the icon next to the, um, next to the website, right. but then after a few days, it just goes back to the default um, IE Icon. How That's do I strange. keep the website icon? Yeah, normally you'll see a, a nice little picture next to it. Not so much in, in, in Netscape Navigator, but sometimes in uh, IE you'll see a little picture next to the icon. What that is, is on the web server, there is a file stored at the root of the web server called favyicon.ico. Uh -huh. And it's just an icon file that, that anybody, anyone that owns a website can create and drag and drop that in there with an icon editor. Uh, once you create that and put that in there, supposedly, if it is when you bookmark it at that time, Pat, it saves mm -hmm. it locally. And then when you go to reference that, you'll see the nice little picture. If it's slashed out, you'll see a little S or whatever it is. Right. Um, we don't have any here, but you get the idea. Here's a little E for Internet Explorer next to it. Why they're disappearing and not reappearing, sometimes... Are they stored in your temp file or are they stored Yeah, maybe if you're else? clearing your cache or something or your temp file. I'm not exactly sure. I do know where they're located on the right. server. But uh, as far as the client side, I'm not really positive. So what we'll do, Anson, is we'll ask everybody out there who's watching if you know how to preserve the nifty little icon. Baby for, icon. <laughs> for the baby icon. <laughs> Email Sarah at techtv.com. Okay, will do. And you'll okay. have a good, great show. I've been watching the show since it was an hour and a half long. 
Keep up the good work. Oh, thanks so much. Right, thank All you for right. your patience. Take care, Anson. Take care. Okay, you take care, too. We're just getting started, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we should mention Anson gets a T-shirt. T-shirt? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you call in with a net cam, you can get a fine black screensaver T-shirt with green lettering. Old school. Old school. Right now, though, we're just getting started. If you have a summer trip planned, stay tuned to find out some of the new maps you might be looking at. And after the break, we continue with the screensavers in D.C. Sarah visits the National Archives to see how tech was used to preserve our nation's most treasured documents. G4 Tech TV, coming May 28th. Stay connected. Welcome back, everybody. It's time now to continue with Washington Week here on the Screensavers. This stop, the National Archives in downtown Washington, D.C. The archives, of course, houses the Charters of Freedom, which include the U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. It's Important stuff, and you'd be surprised how much time and technology is put into preserving it. Take a look. You think hacking into computers is hard? Try hacking into the U.S. Constitution. Since 1776, the history behind the survival of the Declaration of Independence is amazing. These documents have recently been re-encased and protected by a team at the United States Archives. They've mixed technology with simplicity to make sure their symbolism will last forever. I'm standing in front of the Declaration of Independence. If you can make it out, we're looking at the original John Hancock signature. However, this document is fading fast. It's obviously important to preserve. So has anyone ever tried breaking in here? Never. <laughs> I won't either. <laughs> I'm here with Darlene McClurkin, Exhibition Specialist at the National Archives. Darlene, what is it that you do exactly here? Well, I work on the curatorial staff, and every morning I come into the rotunda and check our exhibit cases, make sure everything looks good. And in some of the cases, we have hygrometers, which are little meters that record the relative humidity and the temperature. And why is it so important to keep that range so specific? That's what our conservation staff here at the National Archives has deemed is appropriate for the, these textual records. I think it's time we go talk to some of these conservators and see how they actually do it. I'm here with Kitty Mickelson, who's the senior curator at the National Archives. We're actually in one of their labs right now, and we're looking at a model of an encasement. Kitty, what exactly do you do here? I was part of a very small team that did conservation treatment on the Constitution, the Declaration, the Bill of Rights. Wow. And what we have here is a corner model of the encasement that those documents, each single leaf is displayed in, in the rotunda, which you saw this morning. That's right. So all of the beautiful displays that I, we can get close but you can't touch, this is what it would look like if we cut it up into a piece. Right. This is only a quarter of the whole thing. There's a central passage that's clear here, and that's actually used to um, allow a light beam to travel a W-shaped path. It goes in, there's a window. You see a cutaway of one of two uh, sapphire windows. A light beam can be hooked up to go in one window. It bounces a W path through uh, three different mirrors and goes out the second window. So these beams are measuring what kind of humidity is inside? Correct and whether any oxygen has leaked in. The environment that we fill these encasements with is argon gas. It's an inert gas with mm -hmm. a certain amount of humidity. We want to make sure the humidity doesn't go beyond the range that we want, and we want to make sure no oxygen has leaked in. So this is a way to determine that without opening. With conservators like Kitty, we can rest assured that the Charters of Freedom will remain preserved through the years. energy and money has gone into saving these documents from breaking down even a little. I had asked Kitty if this kind of preservation was similar to the efforts being made right now to save the Mona Lisa, which is also deteriorating if you've heard that in the news. And she said, yeah, although the surfaces and the materials used in these various kinds of documents are different than a painting like that, the ink is going to lift up and off without continuing intervention. So really important to get it started now so that it's not lost for good. Now, if you missed any of the segments we've been airing this week, be sure to tune in next 
next Tuesday, June 1st, for a special one-hour edition of our whole trip to Washington, D.C., with a few extras you're not going to see this week. Inside the FCC Labs, the NSA, National Archives, Space Shuttle, and a lot more. So check it out next Tuesday. Now, still to come on this show, amazing digital maps for your next road trip. And up next, Chuck, our next caller is looking for more power. Can we help? Find out when the screen there is continuing. We're only two days away from the Screensavers land party, powered by NVIDIA. So well What's read. them play? The game is Battlefield 1942, the Desert Combat Mod, version .7. It's got new maps to kill people on, new sounds to hear people die, and new weapons to kill people with. So go to our website and click on Join Our Land Party to register and for links to download the 591 megabyte Desert Combat Mod. If you have dial-up, you're not going to be able to play. If you have broadband, <laughs> Start downloading, yes, probably in a couple hours, because right now, I'd say that site's getting slammed. Get that download accelerator and plus, <laughs> fire it up. And it should only take an hour instead of six. Yes. Anyhow, you also have to have the full version of Battlefield 1942 to play, and we'll see a Thursday Screensavers LAN party. Sounds good. Now, Chuck joins us on the Tech TV Netcam Network from Madisonville, Kentucky. Hey, Chuck. Hello. Hey, Chuck. How are you? Just fine. How are y'all? Excellent. Good. Well, I have a question. I've got a pretty big system with multiple hard drives and CD-ROMs and all that, and I've only got a 300-watt power supply, and I was wanting to know where I can go to find out how much power each thing in my system is uh, using because I'm adding uh, some neon since I've modded the case. Ah, so you're, are you worried about, uh, you know, over overstepping your boundaries with your power supply and having some problems? Your power supply? Yes. Okay. Uh, what, what processor are you using, Chuck? It's uh, AMD Athlon uh, 2200. That's probably around, I think, either 55 or 65 watts, maybe yeah. as much as 75. Some of the newer processors are pulling over 85 watts. That's a light bulb right there. It's a 30 year power supply. Yeah, the video card also. These, these video cards have been sucking out power. What kind of video card do you have? Yeah. It's a uh, GeForce FX 5600. Is that on, us in the background there on the TV? Yes. Can you turn it just a little sideways to the cam? I just want to see what's going on. That's awesome. Look at there I am. Hey. It's a uh, 60 inch uh, Phillips. That sounds Flat crazy. Screen. <laughs> anyway, I never, never, never done that before. I just wanted to do it. So uh, the big, I mean, I'd worry probably less about the individual cards um, than I would about the overall system. How many hard drives do you have in there, Chuck? I have four 80 gig Seagate. That's impressive. Wow. Um, are you know? Wow. Are you doing RAID across those hard drives? Uh, two of them have RAID, and the other two don't. That's awesome. That sounds. He's like got a great setup there. It's a really nice setup. AMD used to have a pretty good site that allowed you to that helped you calculate how big a power supply you need. I'd say off the top of my head, 400 watt power supply should cover your system. Yeah. 500, you know, 400, 450, 500 watts is still pretty extreme until you get to some of the next generation mm -hmm. systems. Um, We'd also recommend searching. Don't necessarily buy the first power supply that you see in the bargain bin that's 400 watts. Right. Power supplies vary. Just yeah. because it says it's 400 watts doesn't mean it's going to give right. you. It may be 400 watts for like 10 seconds. <laughs> it swallows its own tail and takes your data with it, which is really frustrating. What's your favorite power supply vendor uh, up top here? I love if, if PC somebody power else. And yeah, if somebody else is paying for it, PC, PC power, power and cooling. cooling. Yes. If I'm paying for it, there's a bunch of other brands that are out there. Well, I'm um, getting ready to upgrade my processor. So. Okay. Are you gonna? So what? What kind of processor are you going? Well, to? I'm going either with a 2800 or a 3000. I don't think that's going to change your power consumption that much. Yeah. I'd say get at least a 400 watt power supply. Or do you know how the? You ever have like the name of a company and you can't? Can't quite sort of get it. What are you out. looking for? What power the supply name company? of the power supply? Inter I want to say Intermax. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the Intermax, Intermax one. And right? Antec makes some nice ones. Antec Yoshi would know if he was around. I think it took off. Dan, power supplies. Antec, Intermax. Is it Intermax? It's Intermax. Intermax. Yeah, it's Intermax. Yeah, Intermax has some really nice power supplies that aren't so expensive. Yeah. Um, Actually, it'd be a good thing to price watch. But you're going to spend, figure if you're spending less than $50, you're probably not getting a high quality power supply, Chuck. So oh, it'd be pretty much better off if I'm going to add anything else to upgrade yeah. the power supply. I'd yeah. say at least a 400 or 450 watt power supply. It sounds like you're going to keep adding stuff to this system over time. Yeah. You know, 500 watts probably overkill. We've seen 500 watts good. come in here, but they've always been like the water cooled systems and the right. high, high end systems where you have, well, you have actually, has quite a bit of components there, but 400 watts should be just fine. Okay, because. I only wanted to know because I'm getting, I'm adding four neons. So yeah, I don't think the neons yeah, are they're not really going to draw, gonna draw that, much. that much power. Okay. You know, and the other thing is, is you saw that Yoshi did a great article last week where he basically explained he had a. <laughs> 
Okay, the Friday the Thirteenth theme, a little sketchy, <laughs> big guy. It's Halloween, it's my cell phone. I'm gonna back away from the camera now. It's Halloween, Halloween Friday the Thirteenth. <laughs> All I know is there's a knife and somebody dies, and it's not gonna be me. <laughs> Check out Yoshi's article actually for for setting up a second power supply inside your case. It's a really cool yeah. mod you can do if you want to spend a little less money. But yeah, 400 watt power supply should do it. We'll see if we can find that the the AMD had a great page where it basically listed like you yeah. know, rough ideas of how much wattage everything. That's cool. If we find that link, we'll put it in the show notes as well. Yeah, I'd add another 100 watts. We should be good. Thanks for the call, Chuck. Now, here is Sarah with a quick tip. I can do a really good Friday 13th impression. Want to hear it? Yeah. Remember? <laughs> I saw a lot of those. There were like eight of them as a kid. I saw them all like three times. Number three was the best. Using Windows XP's filed and folder permissions can be a daunting task. It's complicated, but even worse, you can lock yourself out if you're not careful. That's silly. There's two basic options that will give you a baseline of security, making files read-only or hidden. So what you do is right-click on any file and go to Properties. And then under Attributes here, make sure read-only and hidden are checked. Remember, an administrator can still view any file, so this won't work with admins. Use it with your kids who have limited access. Now, don't go anywhere. Find out who has the right to your information, the feds or you. And after the break, Pat's going to keep you from getting lost during your summer road trip with some cool maps. That's all when the screensavers are turned. Welcome back to the Screensavers. I'm Kevin Rose. And I'm Patrick Norton. Coming up in this half hour, we're going to talk about well, the heated topic of the U.S. Patriot Act and who has the right to your information, or if you have right to information, and Leo's going to join us with a tip to make. Well, he's going to tell us about his favorite voice over IP, That's cool. cheap telephone service. Mm -hmm. And we got a caller who wants to know how they can get a Gmail account. We're going to talk it's about possible. It. It's P possible. People want them. There's a lot of ways to get a Gmail account without taking pictures of your toes and mailing them to someone. It's a little rude. <laughs> if you like summer road trips and you like using, well, your notebook to explore the nooks and crannies, between Hither and Yam, we got some cool maps to show you. It's cool, right? I walked into local REI and it had two giant stacks of maps. One of them was like Delorme's Topo USA. So REI is selling software now, huh? REI has been selling software for a long time. No idea. And the other one is like National. Oops, sorry about that. And the other one we got here is National Geographic's Backroads Explorer. And I'm like, cool. Two like you know National Geographic's like they're like the map people, right? Delorme have been using their software for years mm -hmm. for road trips, and it's pretty interesting stuff. Like if you hold up a map there, mm -hmm. hold the map towards the camera. Right. You know the idea is right is instead of having a whole bunch of paper maps, you can actually have the entire country at your fingertips in your computer, in a really clean and simple way. Mm -hmm. And you know if you don't mind traveling with a notebook, one of the other nice things you can do is you can have a GPS unit attached to your notebook that will track your I was gonna location. Say, that's, that's the big advantage because I've been using yeah. the, uh, Streets and uh, Trips from Microsoft forever now and I like how it plots out where you're going and yeah, I love you it. You figure out where you are. Yeah. And, you, know, you start making wrong turns, you can figure out how to get back to where you want to be. But mm -hmm. what's interesting, right, part of the reason we brought this big old pile of paper maps is if you take a look, and we're going to click this one open right here. Take a look at this system over here. This is the National Geographic, the Tobo exclamation point maps. And if you start looking at that, it looks exactly like a National Geographic map, the one they'd slide inside the magazine. And you can't really see it, but this is definitely scanned in and compressed because, like, underneath this 80 up here and around these words here, you can actually see the compression artifacts and the digital yeah. compression. You can't see it that much over the camera, but, boy, it's really noticeable up here. And you start clicking in, and you get into a higher level of detail. And let's click in... Uh, Oh, let's let's head this down a little bit. The interface isn't too bad to work with. It's not my Go favorite. Area 51 is it? Area 51. <laughs> I have no idea where that it's is. Right Nevada. north of Nevada test site. Right north of uh, Las Vegas. Well, I, I was going to compare Indian you. Springs. There we go. Okay, because I had this really nice demo okay. set up, but we've we've just we've just shanghai this. <laughs> so where you, you you mouse where I you want to go? I got excited. I thought we could find something cool. <laughs> we can find something. Well, Frenchman, click on there Frenchman's where you want to go. Right over here. Frenchman's flat. Yes. So okay. now we're gonna. And oh, look at that. I can't here. find it. Well, what's interesting... Oh, wait, right? there it is. There it is. Okay. Yeah, but you notice how it's definitely got... You know, if you look closely, you can see under the Nevada up in the corner, you definitely have the compression artifacts in here. It doesn't get really detailed. What's really interesting about the, the National Geographic maps, check this out. There's 17 CD-ROMs in this wow. thing. And so if you want to have all of the information in your system, you get to manually copy all wow. 17 CD-ROMs. You're not getting that off Kazaa. No, no way. <laughs> well, maybe. Somebody yeah. could create one giant zip file. True. But it's like, it's a, I thought that was immensely frustrating. It's not the easiest thing to import. You've got to do it manually. And I've got to be honest with you, I'm not really impressed 
with the quality of the maps. They're paper maps. They've been scanned in. If you're right. a big fan of paper maps and you don't mind the compression artifacts, it might not be a bad way to go. The other thing is if you want to get the highest resolution topographic maps, you've got to buy an individual set for each state. So mm -hmm. there's a, one for Nevada. There's one for California. What are we talking price-wise on this? I mean, well, you're talking about, for the basic package, you're talking about 100 bucks, and okay. if memory serves, the individual states are $50 a piece. So it can start to really add up. If you're going on a long road trip and you want, like, you know, or if, you know, if you're a hiker or something, if you want a lot of these maps, you start paying money. Now, if you're only going to a small area, there's places you can go and print out the maps right. or just buy regular USGS maps. Right. But check this out. It's one of, like, a, one of the things that the Topo doesn't have, the National, Geogra National Geographic doesn't have, is you notice, see this big red line here? So I basically plotted out a road trip here. Mm -hmm. The Topo, unless I, I just can't figure out how to do it in National Geographic, it won't give me the route to go from point A to point B. And what I did here is I set up a nice road trip. I go from San Francisco to Snowmass, Colorado. I'm stopping at AOR 4x4 in Grand Junction. and automatically plots it out. Now take a look at what happens. We talked about the essentially those are raster maps on the other system we showed. They're mm -hmm. scanned in maps. Right. But take a look at how these look different as I start scanning in here to bring in a closer area. So these, these are vector maps. Oh, these are mathematical so, representations oh, of, of the data that makes up a, uh, of a map. So we got Pahrump up here. Let's scroll this up a little bit, and it's going to fill in. There we go. There's Tonopah, and as I, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Don't you love it when you grab the wrong part of the map? So we're going <laughs> to, I'm going to scroll out here a little bit, right. and we're going to, but you notice how it's a little bit faster to use, mm -hmm. unless, of course, you're on television and everything slows down. <laughs> but uh, the information is a lot clearer. Now, the, you, know, you, you can obviously notice some of, the, some of the uneasiness and jagginess in the lines, but as they start to circle in on stuff, I can keep going in. They don't tell you to buy a second or third set of maps oh, to go cool. in on this one. So it's all in one. Now, how about exactly. this option here for the road? It gives you the quickest route. Can you also choose by a scenic route? Yeah, if you want? or another choice one. One of the other interesting things they do in this is you'll notice as I keep drilling down on this, mm -hmm. it still gives you a nice, clean representation of the lines and let me show you one more cool thing about this is it shades it in it starts to get really clean and nice and detailed now one of the really interesting things about this is you may like it you may think it's kind of goofy you can turn on a 3d map now look at the left side there as I turn that on what it's going to do is render out a, 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 the side view of it oh, that's <laughs> I gotta figure out what I'm running in the background on this system because it should be <laughs> running a lot faster and I can change the angle so if I want to follow a road up the hill I can turn on the information, I can turn on the horizon oh, nice. and I can change the angle and I can actually exaggerate the details so I can figure out what kind of terrain I'm going to I mean this is cool for in. you, you gotta love this because you do all the off-road racing and things like that and you, this way you actually yeah. get to see the terrain it helps a little bit, yeah. it's, it's, not, you know, it's not quite one to one but it's a really really nice to have more information in there and I love the fact for a hundred bucks, the uh, DeLorme gives you the entire United States. It gives you an incredible letter, level of detail and resolution, and it's easy to import the data disk. And it's one DVD of data, not 17 nice. CDs. It's easy to basically run the install. Works with the GPS, system. too? Works with the GPS. Tells you to turn left when you're supposed to turn left? I don't do that. I, I, I never that. use that. So you love that stuff. That's cool stuff. You'll have to try that one out. we got more information, links to the map product we just showed on our website, thescreensavers.com. Excellent. Good stuff. Yeah. Let's check in with Dan for some very important information. Thank you, fellas. The Tech TV Digital Digs Roadshow is heading to a town near you. The next stop is Atlanta, Georgia. Come on out and meet Jessica Corbin, Morgan Webb, uh, Adam Sessler, too, of course, yeah. Uh, this is all at the uh, Lenox Square Mall on Saturday, June 5th from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Sunday, June 6th from noon to 5. Not bad. Now, there you are. The latest craze is Gmail. Find out how to get it right after the break. But up next, the author from An the Anarchist in the Library is here to tell us that the government restricts the free flow of information on the Internet. All that when the screen saver comes back. G4, TV for Gamers, and Tech TV are contesting to form the only network taking digital entertainment to the next level. Sound fun? I love video games. Plugged in to every aspect of games, gear, gadgets, and gigabytes. That was unexpected, right? Okay. You're uh, watching G4 Tech TV. G4 Tech TV. Stay connected. Coming May 28th. For more information, go to G4TechTV.com. Welcome back to the Screensavers. Well, we were in D.C. This is D.C. Week. I'm Patrick Norton. How are your freedoms as Americans being impacted by the government's efforts for national security? Author of The Anarchist in the Library, a cultural historian, media scholar, and he's a director of communication studies at NYU. Please welcome Siva Vaidyanathan to the Screensavers. Welcome. Good to be here. This is, this is a pretty serious book. The clash between freedom and control is hacking the real world and crashing the system. 
you're 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 angry. You're fired up. I, I'm a little bit scared. I'm a little bit worried. I mean, I I, I see I've seen so many conversations mm -hmm. since September 11th that seem to be encased in panic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm worried that our policymakers are rushing to judgment, um, not really examining the ways that they are altering our information ecosystems. Um, and I worry about the future of democracy uh, with these pretty radical changes. Case in point, the Patriot Act. You know, mm -hmm. I read, therefore, I'm threatening the United States government. What's going on? How do you feel that Patriot Act, it seems like some people are starting to, to, to stand back from the Patriot Act in Congress and say, this was not one of our better ideas. Other people seem to want to sort of advance it towards a, you know, I, I'd, I'd almost say, you know, pushing towards the whole Nazi Germany edge of, of control and observation. Yeah. I don't think we're, I don't think we're close to being uh, in danger like Nazi Germany, but I do think we, we see in the Patriot Act a really bad trend. Mm -hmm. They passed the bill without reading it. Now we're debating the effects of it years down the line. I think that's the wrong way to yeah. make policy. You're supposed to sit down, think about the repercussions of the act, talk it through, come up with the best possible ideas, and then pass it. Exactly. We, we should have had a good argument at the front end. Mm -hmm. Instead, now we're trying to make sense of the ramifications. But you know the Patriot Act is self-denying. Mm -hmm. We actually don't have any evidence of how it's affecting people's habits or what the investigations uh, held under the Patriot Act encompass because people are sworn to secrecy about mm -hmm. it. Well, we would, it's kind of interesting. When you started this book, I think it started as a book about Napster originally right. and, and looking at the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I mean, there any, are there any parallel trends with what's happening to information and, and a citizens' access to it? Well, that's what I started to see. I mean, I thought I would write a book just about entertainment. But, mm -hmm. uh, but after September 11th, it became clear that information policy, information warfare, mm -hmm. was going to be a big part of our lives for probably the rest of this century. Uh, and that meant that I felt like I really had to make these connections. If we were, if we were talking about the ways that governments and big institutions like corporations are going to restrict flows of information, mm -hmm. whether it's attacking peer-to-peer -peer systems or uh, uh, being worried about terrorists using public libraries mm -hmm. to check their email, um, I felt that there were connections we can make in an ecological sense, because we really are talking about our information ecosystems. When you say an ecological sense, are you talking about creating an idea that there should be a right to information, something like the EFF would say that information wants to be free, or, or because it's interesting, because a lot of people, they, they find a soapbox, they jump up on it, and they say, America can't be safe until we stop all access to this information. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's not something I, you know... Well, you know, if we'd had an intelligent and informed debate over security uh, two years ago when we should have, um, we would have said... Uh, all cockpit doors should be sealed and secure, right. and that's step one, right? Any security expert knows that the simplest solution is usually the most effective solution. Instead, we've tried this, uh, this whole variety of policy interventions that have nothing to do with the real threat, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's what really alarms me. We have a very poor habit of discussing technology in public. Well, it's because, you know, anything that's far, advanced, far enough advanced is indistinguishable from magic, right? It's just, let, let the weenies shut it off. Nobody really needs to and know And, you know, this di digital technology and networking, because it's so fresh, mm -hmm. we don't even see, uh, as a country, we don't even see when it's simply an extension of habits that we've been engaging in for centuries, mm -hmm. uh, like the sharing of music, right? We, sure. we freak out because it's, it's new and it's electrified, and we think that it must be... Uh, horribly dangerous, right. instead of stepping back and saying, how is this affecting our culture, the growth of our culture, how is this affecting creativity and free speech? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Jack Valenti was against the VCR, now he's against, you know, trading files on the internet, which on the other hand, I can understand, people have a right to, you know, I mean, you'd probably be pretty miffed if I scanned this thing in and made it available on, on AIM or something, I mean. Well, I wouldn't be miffed if you checked it out of the library. Right. Not every use of copyrighted material deserves an immediate payment. However, I, I think that the way we ran our copyright system for centuries was really good. Mm -hmm. Now we've shifted the, the focus into the machines itself, and I think that's a really uh, rough and clumsy way to, to, to handle information. What about the idea of, of patron privacy, that people shouldn't have to be registered to read information? I mean, that's really important. That's mm -hmm. really important. I mean, we, we and, and our founding fathers understood this. I mean, this is a very conservative book in the sense mm -hmm. that it really appeals to anyone who, who believes that Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were onto something mm -hmm. when they said that the government shouldn't pry into our thoughts and our, and our immediate conversations, uh, that we should know more about the government than the government knows about us. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be a radical statement in this country. It is part of our founding beliefs. Unfortunately, these days, that's, that sort of opinion seems marginal. Well, it also seems interesting, like we, we've seen cases where insurance companies are trying to be able to copyright databases, uh, or, or that the idea that 
you know, if you access my telephone, you know, directory information, right? Which, you know, and now it's it's like, well, it's it's legal for anybody to access the yellow pages or create their own version of the yellow pages. It's not proprietary information. But now that we're we're running into a scene where it's just because it's put on a server, people are trying to have the same laws in effect. The idea that you could have your, you know, the, the, your 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 phone number is copyrighted and it belongs to someone and no one else can reprint it or use it or you have to pay a nickel every time if somebody gives you direct your right. assistance. Hey, where do you see all that? I mean, that seems like an illogical extreme, but sure. it's just one or two acts of Congress away. Well, today we see that the governor of California wants to protect his image so that people can't make fun of him. Uh, and he's suing a company that's producing a bobblehead doll. I mean, that's that's so anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a man who is swept into office on a on a fairly radically demo democratic process, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, I think that raises some serious values questions. We should be having an argument over values. We should be saying how information rich should the American people be? How much should we be able to play with our own culture and our own symbols? Mm -hmm. uh, and if we decide that we err on the side of freedom, then we have to undo a lot of these changes and trends. How do we do that? Or if our viewers are kind of interested about how to help this process along, what do you recommend? There are a lot of organizations sprouting up uh, all over the place. Uh, you know, uh, getting involved with the Electronic Frontier Foundation is a good start. Uh, there's a, a, an organization in Washington called publicknowledge.org that is staying on top of legislation that deals with information policy. Uh, there's widespread activism when it comes to the FCC because the FCC has time and time again worked toward the concentration of information and culture and against the democratization of, of information and culture. And, and those are the sorts of uh, levels of activism that are really starting to solidify now. And I, I'm actually pretty, pretty bullish on, on the movement at this point. Very good. Siva, thank you so much thank for you, taking Patrick. the time to talk to us. Ladies and gentlemen, his book, The Anarchist in the Library, How the Clash Between Freedom and Control is Hacking the Real World and Crashing the System. Excellent read. Check it out, ladies and gentlemen. And stay where you are. More screensavers coming your way in just a couple minutes. FCC Chairman Michael Powell for some of his favorite gadgets. Dick DiBartolo joins us with his picks from this year's National Hardware Show. And Sarah's going to show you how to hide one or multiple drives, hard drives, from your operating system with a little red jet. A little mini dark tipper over there. A little mini tipper. Yes. Short tipper. Now, Travis joins us on the phone from Ridgeway, Colorado. Angry tipper. <laughs> this is an angry hey, Travis. Hey, guys. How's, How's it going, going, Travis? Really good. Good to hear it. How can we help you today? Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get a Gmail account. Ooh, the why, oh, hey, Gmail I gotta ask, accounts. why do you want a Gmail account, Travis? One gigabyte of storage is awesome. Do you have a gig of email right now and it's just, you know, you're starting to spill over so you want to move it all to your Gmail? You got it. Wow. Wow. You get a lot of email. <laughs> and you don't, you basically want the web access, you don't want to just download it onto your desktop and use an application that way? Exactly, yeah. So, uh, do you like begging, Travis? <laughs> Not particularly. Well, you know, because we had to beg. Yes, we, we beg. Did. Technically, we don't have Gmail accounts because journalists aren't supposed to have Gmail accounts. Or even well, they can for review. We're reviewing them. Right? Actually, it's interesting. They're they're not supposed to be giving them out so much. Oh, really? Yeah. Cause somebody told me like, I'll give you this account, but you didn't get it from me. So check it out. Gmail, right? For those of you who don't know, Gmail is Google's email system. The big attraction, of course, is the one gigabyte of storage. It's in public beta right mm -hmm. now. Now, one quick question though: Do you have a blogger account by chance? Um, I don't think I do. Okay, there's there's a service called Blogger. They were giving away like one in every 20 Blogger members wow. received a free invitation. If you logged into your Blogger right. account, there would be a little invite. So I know a lot of people, if you're a Blogger user, check that out right now if you want a Gmail account. That could be a possible way. Every so often they give people who already have Gmail accounts the right, the privilege of inviting other people to Gmail accounts. So if you know someone with a Gmail account, this is when you start begging. You can if you go up to gmail.com and go through the bottom of the FAQ, it'll allow you to type in your email address and and basically hope that they'll submit one to you sometime because we don't know when this actually it's might go, go public yeah. go public now there is another choice eBay they're all over the place on eBay people are selling their invitations right now it's looking like uh, I saw one there for about thirty five dollars down further yeah. you're looking to buy it now for eighty dollars if you want it you're looking to spend about between fifty and eighty dollars if you want to bid to get an invite now people call me crazy a lot of you are saying like why yeah. would you ever do that I would do that because 
I tried to get a Yahoo account. The only mm -hmm. thing I could get was like K Rose 2087, and that sucks. You know, nobody wants that. <laughs> I wanted Kevin Rose at Yahoo.com. Couldn't get it, but uh, I did get that with uh, with something similar to that with Gmail. Yeah. Or you could start your own, you could start your own website and get it that way. You're not going to get a gigabyte of storage. Yeah. The other thing you do is Gmail Swap is a site that's been getting some press lately, and it's basically people who so desperately want a Gmail site. So let's look at have, do you have a looking for a Gmail account and the swap list? So it's the stuff people will trade. Now let's go to this. Just I saw a broken down car. They were trading for a Gmail account. Seventy dollars on payment. Two hundred free Netscape accounts. A real mouse named Mickey. A top <laughs> secret classified picture. Your girlfriend online for one month. Uh, someone to chat with. <laughs> so you know, check out the Gmail swap. If you want to spend the cash, check out the eBay. Otherwise, just sit around and wait like everybody else is doing. Good luck. Good luck. Now, Leo. Hey, Leo. What's up? We're talking with the, the chairman of the FCC this week as we go to Washington, D.C. on the screensavers. And, you know, I have to say, he talked me into something. Michael Powell did. We were at Best Buy together. He talked me into buying this. It's Vonage. It is voice over IP using your broadband for telephone. And Michael was right. This thing's amazing. Vonage is one of many voice over IP providers. They're the best known. For 39 bucks, you get the box. You take it home. You have to go to their website to activate it. No customer service reps. This is the uh, pretty easy step-by-step -step instructions. Didn't wasn't that hard for me to do. No customer service reps. You sign in. You give them the MAC address of the device. This becomes you. This unique network device address. This is your voice terminal. Now the beauty of that is you can carry this with you anywhere. Anywhere there's broadband, and you say, and your phone number goes with you. They assigned me a phone number within 10 minutes. I mean, instantly uh, via email, I had my new phone number. It literally took me half an hour to set this up. If you have some unusual configurations, you use PPPoE on a DSL connection or you have a static IP address, you'll log into the voice terminal just as you would with a Linksys broadband router and, and enter in those settings by hand. It really is very simple. And now for $30 a month, I have high-quality Internet telephony over my broadband connection, get all the features like three-way calling, call waiting, call forwarding. I even get some additional features that only can be offered on the Internet. And long distance is free in the U.S. and Canada, $30 a month. I think this is the future of telephones. Lonage. Take a look at it, guys. I think you're going to like it. I'll be calling. That looks cool. I want to give that a try. Yeah, it's interesting. But, like, you got to pay for broadband, and I got right. DSL, so broadband I'm already paying 50 30. bucks a month for... Unlimited, though. Unlimited long distance. That's I can get unlimited long distance for 20 bucks. That's good. Sprint has that, too, myself. Still, though. You got the cable. Might be a good way to go. Good stuff, Leo. Thanks, Leo. Stay where you are, because up next, we're going to be checking our inbox to see what's on your mind when the screensavers continue. Uh, it's that time once again... Well, before we go to email, so we actually a bunch of people emailed in. They said ah, yes. of an application called Favorg. If we, I don't know if we can show the, we have the it on computer home base. Home base. Right? Yeah. It's a PC mag free download. It's designed to Favicons. Is that those are called? Yeah, Favicons. The ICO. It's a little mm -hmm. tiny file. That, but supposedly, if you download and install this, this will help fix that problem. Scan for the icons from your favorite websites mm -hmm. and, and load them onto your system. Cool. And monitor them. Sounds good. Now, Sarah, do you have any final email? Yeah, Brian from Houston, Texas has a suggestion, a download suggestion. I know you guys recommend Download Accelerator, and I personally use Get Right for downloading Linux ISOs, but I have found the mother of all download utilities. It's Net Transport by Xi, X-I. Hmm. That's at xi-soft.com. Hmm. So. We'll I've never played with that Heads one. Heads yeah. up on that one. Cool. We'll try it tonight. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Jeff from Clinton Township, Michigan says, Is it possible to run a web server on my Windows XP Pro machine? I have DSL with a static IP, and the websites I'm going to host are just a few pages for my dealers to go prices for my business, friends' business. It's not going to have a lot of traffic. Did he say he had a static IP address? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can do it even with the dynamic. There's certain utilities that you can use. Right. But he could uh, download Indiana. a free copy of Apache and put it on there. Uh, they have Apache for Windows. You can use the, you know, the Internet server that's built into Windows. Yeah, Internet Information Server he can download. I'm not yeah. sure how it works for XP. The, I'd have to check into that, but I know Apache works fine. Well, the question is, is like, how do you keep it secure and safe? Because people are going to be scanning. Even though nobody knows about your system, people are going to be scanning constantly looking for vulnerable systems. So you really need to make sure you know, you've, you've got every security patch loaded and you keep on top of yeah. that. Yes, indeed. 
Mm. Another quick one? Real quick. Uh, you guys mention software swapping on peer-to-peer -peer networks all the time, but you never mention getting songs and movies from news groups. Any information you'd like to share about downloading from those? News groups <laughs> have been around forever. They're yeah. a great resource. They're um, kind of overwhelmed with spam a lot of the time, or at least some of them. Yeah, to go you know, to. it's it's tricky. It's tricky. There's a lot. It depends on what you, you want to get You know what? There's Google. If you can't figure yes. it out from Google, you don't get to download the stuff from news <laughs> groups. I'm sorry. That one you need to do yourself. That's it for this edition of the Screen <laughs> I'm Kevin Rose. And I'm Patrick Norton. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to thank our guests, Steva Giannathan and Darlene McClurkin and Kitty Nicholson of the National Archives. See you next time.